Well, welcome to the SSDS webinar, session number four already. And we, uh, we do welcome you. And we're talking today about how to respond to persecution, one of my favorite sessions uh, in this seminar. And uh, it's a, a very um, significant week in which we do this. This is Holy Week, as we call it, on the church calendar. And the week that we focus on what Jesus accomplished for us and how much he suffered indeed uh, for us and for our sin and for our salvation. And so we focus uh, on him and uh, his teaching tonight as well. So let's pray as we begin. Father, we thank you for this week that helps us to really zero in on the incredible incredible event we call the cross when jesus gave of himself sacrificially on my behalf on our behalf on everyone's behalf and we thank you for his humility that he showed during that week riding on a donkey's colt on sunday washing his disciples feet and just showing servant leadership and then giving of himself wanting not his will, but your will be done. So we pray that we would follow in his footsteps. Help us to, to be more and more like Jesus. And we pray that tonight you would give us um, a, a blessed time together as we consider what he teaches us. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're um, last week we uh, promoted Floyd Brobel's book called Trouble on the Way has an extra reading, Persecution in the Christian Life, a brand new book, uh, Voice of the Martyrs. He's the Canadian director. And this week we have another Canadian book. Boy, Jim, you and I have been really plugging the Canadian books so far. Um, Glenn Penner, Floyd Brobel, and now Daryl Johnson, Discipleship on the Edge, an expository journey through the book of Revelation. This is one of the uh, secondary texts that we use in our seminary course called Theology of Persecution and Discipleship. It's an excellent, excellent book. Uh, Daryl Johnson was a pastor for years. In fact, he pastored in the Philippines where Diane and I went to church uh, just at the time we were moving to Singapore. So we did not have him as a pastor very long, but he was an excellent, excellent, and is an excellent preacher. He later became a teacher, a professor at uh, Regent College in Vancouver, and then also the pastor at First Baptist Church downtown Vancouver until he retired. Uh, his, his greatest interest all his life has been the book of Revelation. He says it's the book that people know about the most and know uh, uh, of what it means the least. And so over 25 years, he read every book that has been written on Revelation and studied it himself and finally put this book together. And he says, it's not a book about uh, pictures. It's a book about discipleship. How can we be disciples of Jesus uh, as we see the end of the age coming? And so it's really a worthwhile read. And at the end of the book, he shows you how the structure of Revelation is actually in a chiasm form, as we talked about last week with um, Isaiah 53. And what the central verse is, and later perhaps in one of our sessions we'll be focusing in on that. Our song to begin with tonight is uh, a song especially for Holy Week and uh, remembering what Jesus accomplished for us. And it's a beautiful song. I trust you'll be blessed by it. Oh, when I think of how he left his home in glory, home in glory, came and dwelt among the lowly such as I, such as I, to suffer shame and suffer. Grace on Mount Calvary 
first of all, some people say it could never happen here. Others say it doesn't happen anymore. Others say they have no time to think about it. And those are people who just really do exactly that. Just don't even think about it. And you have the opposite extreme where you have um, almost a spiritualization of, of it. God will see us through hard times, some say. Others say persecution brings growth. And that is what we would probably call a half-truth, and we'll explain that along. Yes, there are areas where the church is persecuted and it's growing, but there's just the opposite in other places at different times. Or people say persecution is from God, let's welcome it. Well, that's, that's, in the long run, that is true, but it's a whole different perspective. Um, we had a, uh, um, Jim had a pastor for years at Willingdon Church where he was an elder, uh, who is now the teacher on Back to the Bible Canada, Dr. John Newfeld. And here's what he says about that topic. So let's learn how the gospel advances. Number one, through persecution. Now notice what I'm not saying. I didn't say because of persecution. You notice that? Persecution is not a magical thing that makes the gospel go forward. All sorts of countries in the world where persecution has come against the church has actually destroyed the church. I mean, some of us have this idea what we really need is persecution, but that's not really biblical. The gospel progresses through persecution. What I mean here is that God ordains opposition and that through the very opposition that he ordains, new opportunities will rise. So that's, that's John's perspective. And it's right on. He was teaching from Philippians uh, where Paul says that because of his imprisonment, the gospel had actually advanced. And uh, he was expounding on that. But it's a very good perspective to realize that we should not pray for persecution. Uh, God ordains it, and out of that ordaining of persecution, uh, blessing occurs. And this is the verse we want to focus on to start this evening from Luke chapter 6. Uh, Luke 6 is the parallel of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And it's the uh, Sermon on the Plain, as we call it. And if uh, those of you who visited Israel uh, would have probably a really good picture of this, because you see Jesus in Matthew, it said he went up on the mountain with his disciples, uh, which which it is. I mean, uh, it's it's like um, it's not quite the mountains like the Rockies, but very high hills in Galilee. And uh, then when you come down the mountain, where the where the uh, Church of the Beatitudes or the Mount of Beatitudes, they think they call it for tourists to visit. I was there just probably a year and a half ago. And uh, now that whole plain, and there's there's a sloping, you come down the hill and there's a large sloping plain right there. And you can see how they are up high, but they're still on a plain area. And that's where Jesus taught. And so there's no uh, discrepancy between Matthew and Luke. It's just the perspective at which you look at that at that geographic area. And while they were on that plain, which by the way today is filled with banana plants, uh, the Israelis don't waste any space. And so the Mount of Beatitudes is filled with banana plants. But Jesus said in Luke 6, what is essentially a description of persecution. Uh, Jim and I have worked on an attempt to define persecution ever since we've been teaching this for 20 years. And there is no definition that satisfies everyone. It's, it's one of the most unusual words uh, to try and literally define in a way that every scholar and every lay person uh, will accept and understand. So we've decided then, let's not work on definition, let's work on description. And Luke 6, 22 uh, is where Jesus gives us this great description of persecution. Now in Matthew, he said, blessed are the persecuted. Here in Luke, it's phrased this way. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you, and insult you, 
and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. And so here Jesus gives a description. He uses four verbs to describe what we would call persecution. Uh, hatred, exclusion, insult, and rejection, or rejecting your name as evil, just rejecting you. And why? Not because you are nasty, and Peter says we have to make sure that's the case, but because of the Son of Man. So this persecution comes because of Jesus in you. And this is what Jesus says you can expect. And notice, it's a blessing. It's not a blessing I hear many people pray for. Um, and yet, this is a, a, a blessing when it happens. And it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like chili peppers. This is a picture off of Jim's um, website. If you go to goteachglobal.com, and I hope you will, because that's, that's Jim's excellent uh, website. He has a good webmaster, so that's why I'll put in a plug for it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and on that website, you'll see this great picture of a chili pepper. And it shows you that chili peppers can come from the green tip at the bottom, which is zero heat, up to the very top red, which is super, super hot. In fact, I forget the terms they use for these now are really quite funny. But this is what persecution is like. So, yes, when we think of persecution and use those big three terms, we're looking at the top of this pepper. And that's countries like North Korea you see over on the left. And uh, halfway down, you've got a medium, medium. And, um, and then over on, on, the, on the bottom left, you have you have the uh, mild, or actually on the bottom right as well, you have Canada, which we consider, you know, persecution here exists, but it is mild persecution. See, all four verbs that Jesus used when he said, you are blessed when men hate you, when they exclude you, insult you, reject you, all of those can be experienced in a mild form as well as a hot form or a difficult form. So persecution is a broad, broad subject and topic, and it's, um, it's one that we really want to um, focus on today and try and understand that it's, it's graded. It can be hot in one place and very, very mild in another, such as North America, but it is still persecution. And it happens because of Jesus. So when it happens to you because of Jesus, that's the persecution, not because maybe if you have a, uh, you know, a grating personality and you rub people the wrong way, um, you might consider that persecution, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. He uses these four verbs, hate, exclude, insult, reject. And you'll notice, if you can see the colors uh, differentiation there, it's not so strong on this slide as it is in some of what we do. But those four verbs, uh, which are, by the way, NIV, this, uh, this reads only this way in the New International Version. Uh, H for hate, exclude, starts with an E, insult with an I, and reject with an R. So you have another word there, air. So if you are hated, excluded, insulted, and rejected, you are an heir, and that takes us to another scripture that's a significant one in Romans 8, 17. The Apostle Paul is talking about our becoming children of God and, and how the Holy Spirit within us enables us to cry out to our Father, Abba, Father. And he says, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And then you have this verse that's here on our screen. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. That's the word we just saw spelled with four verbs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. That's a credible verse. Now, you hear people quote the first part all the time. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Full stop. But that's not how the verse reads. 
Actually, the second half is very, very connected to the first half. We are heirs of God and we are co-heirs with Jesus if we share in Jesus' sufferings. In order that the day will come when we may also share in his glory. And that's what we'll be, we'll be celebrating this Sunday on Easter as we celebrate the glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus and what all of that will bring for us in the days ahead. But in the meantime, we share in his sufferings. And when we do, we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Here's a graph that uh, Jim made. Jim loves to do graphics, as you can see. And uh, we shared this one because in the textbook, it's just black and white, and you don't really see the dynamics uh, and depth of it as you see in this chart. This is what we call the Air Persecution Index, H-E-I-R, from that Luke, uh, Luke 6, 22 scripture verse. You see that the uh, four verbs are at the top, H-E-I-R. They hate you, they'll exclude you, they'll insult you, and reject you. Uh, that's intimidation, containment, harassment, and destruction. And the, the, the graph has a uh, vertical, um, the vertical line is democratic Christian rights versus dictatorial anti-Christian regimes. So you have the uh, scale on the left is uh, political in a sense of what what political system is working in these countries and then the bottom scale going uh, uh, on, on the horizontal frame is increasing persecution so the farther you go up the scale the more persecution there is and it's simply a scale to show you that there is persecution in all these places but it's much milder. It's like chili pepper here on the bottom. I, I, I often like to use the image uh, because I love Indian curry and I enjoy it hot. And curry can be hot, medium, and mild as well. And it's like uh, the air chart is showing us North Korea, persecution is very severe. And it's because you have both a dictatorial anti-Christian regime in, in control of that country and the people and therefore increasing persecution and it goes in a gradation down the down the steps if you will you go you can go from the hottest step down to a country like saudi arabia uh, where for 1500 years there has not been a church building and no official church in that country anywhere and yet there are literally hundreds of christians in saudi arabia uh, today uh, but no church building. And that's something we'll be talking about in a few weeks uh, coming up is the whole concept of the church. And uh, dropping down from there, you have Sudan and then Indonesia and then Canada and the U.S. So this is, uh, this is the way of the cross. So you can see the cross there in the, in the chart, the way that the cross forms. And the verse at the bottom, which we just looked at. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. So Jesus goes on to say in Luke chapter 6, in verses 27 to 28, and this, this is the part that is so amazing. So first of all, he tells us in four verbs what we can expect as his followers when we follow him, and also uh, the fact that it's a blessing when we have those, those four things, hatred, exclusion, insult, and rejection. But then he goes on to say, but to you who are listening, it's, it's interesting that he, he uses this expression quite often to, you know, people heard him, but Maybe some of them weren't really listening. So he says, if you're really listening to me, here's what I say. I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. So we have four descriptions of persecution. 
And now he gives us four verbs of reaction. Okay. So what, how should our reaction be when we experience that stuff? Well, he says, we're to love our enemies. We're to do good to those who hate us, bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. And so this is how Jesus says, and he's speaking here individually. He's talking to his disciples, you know, in this, in this, in the Sermon on the Mount, essentially, and in Luke 6, he is talking essentially to his disciples, maybe a large group, because he had many disciples beyond the 12, but uh, these were still disciples. And so this is what he is saying to you and me as followers. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, he says, when this persecution comes, here's how you respond. You love your enemies. You do good to those who hate you. You bless those who curse you. You pray for those who mistreat you. And so it, it's not all about me. It's all about how I live the Jesus way uh, in the situation. And then he goes on to give four incredible applications or illustrations of how that works. So how does that work? Well, he says in verses 29 to 31, if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. That's his first illustration. And there are four of them here. First one is a really interesting one, and I wish we had a lot more time, because when we do our seminars, we, we spend a good time on this because it's, it's a great visual. Um, the Middle Eastern people were great for, for hitting on the cheek, like just hitting with the back of the hand on the, on the, you know, just like a flick of the hand on the, on the cheek of someone. And Jesus says, when somebody does that to you, don't, don't retaliate by hitting them back. You turn to them the other cheek also, because when you do that, it forces them to either hit you with the flat of their hand rather than the back of the hand. They either, if they're either going to have to hit you with the flat of the hand, or they're going to think, oh, I really didn't want to hit this guy and I'm not going to do it. Um, and so it makes them stop and think and evaluate whether they really want to be violent or not. And uh, that's how a Christian, he says, is to respond um, when someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other also. Second illustration, if someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. So, so if somebody needs your coat, he says, hey, take, take my shirt too. Well, you know, that's, that's, that's a little far out for some of us in North America. Um, but that's, I mean, th uh, th this was Jesus' attitude. Remember, another parallel he gave in other teachings was when, when you're compelled to walk a mile, then go two miles. Well, you know, the Roman soldiers could compel any Jewish person as occupying uh, army of the country at the time to carry his pack for a mile. And Jesus says, Christian, who, one who follows Jesus, is not just going to carry it for a mile. You say, okay, I'll carry it two miles. Or if you're really generous, you say, hey, where do you live? I'll carry it all the way home for you. Uh, that's the attitude that Jesus says, one of his followers, a disciple, has. If someone takes your coat, don't even withhold your shirt. Let them have the shirt too. The third one gets even, even more specific. Give to everyone who asks you. Give to everyone who asks you. Now this one, boy, I have rarely ever heard this preached much in North America. Because this is not our... North American attitude, right? You know, my, my things are very important to me. And um, that money I earned, I worked hard to get, and I'm very careful with every penny. And um, you're asking me, Jesus, to give to everybody who asks me? Now, Diane and I had the pleasure of living for 12 wonderful years in the Philippines. And uh, every time your car stopped on the road, there were people banging on your window asking for money. They were either really cute kids that were very, you know, kind of dirty and gringy and needing, needing something to eat, or somebody who was handicapped in some way, which just really pulled at your heartstrings. And um, the missionaries that we worked with, 
the, the Western missionaries I'm talking about now, the foreign missionaries, especially Westerners, really had a problem with this statement, give to everyone who asks you. And one of those missionaries said to me, I just came back from India. If I gave something to everybody who asked me for money, I would be broke. I'd come back absolutely flat broke. And I, my only response to him was, well, would Jesus be upset with you if you were broke because you gave it all away? I mean, wasn't there a rich young ruler who he told, if you really want to follow me, give all your money away and come and follow me? Well, that that didn't sit too well there because we think, well, that money is mine. And, you know, we have to realize, of course, that everything we have comes from God. And Jesus says, you give to everyone who asks you. That is incredible. And then he goes on to the fourth point. If anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Whoa, Lord, now you've gone too far. I mean, if somebody says, I want your car, can I borrow your car, Paul? And I say, yeah, sure, take it. Don't bother bringing it back. You know, <laughs> yeah, right, right. That's going to happen. Eh? Well, that's, that's what Jesus is saying. You know, if, if somebody takes something that belongs to you, and other translations say if someone borrows or borrows, as we would say in Canada, borrow something from you, do not demand it back. Wow. And then, of course, comes that underlying principle that all of this is based on is what we call the golden rule. Do to others as you would have them do to you. And that's the bottom line in this whole passage. So those four things all fit together. So this graph or chart shows you the four things that we can expect on the persecution side and the four responses Jesus gives us and the four applications. So in Luke 6, we are told you are blessed when, when men hate you, when they exclude you, when they insult you, and when they reject you because of the Son of Man, because of Jesus. But here's how you respond. You do good to others. You pray for them. You bless them. You love even your enemies. Incredible teaching. And then he shows four applications of it. So when someone hits you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. Someone takes your coat, give them your shirt too. Give to everyone who asks of you. And don't demand back your stuff. Now, I, my, my conclusion to this, you say, well, how, how is that practical in, in our life today? Well, I think what Jesus is really saying here, he's, he's not saying that you shouldn't have things and you shouldn't take care of your things. Um, but he is saying here that people are way more important than things. And, of course, we know this throughout all of his teaching. When he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, don't, don't lay them up here, lay them there. And you do that by sharing with others. But Jesus was always for people. He, he exhibited a reality of understanding that we are created in the image of God. All people are created in the image of God. And therefore, every human being is important. And stuff is only stuff. And so he says, you know, make sure you put people ahead of your stuff. Stuff is replaceable. Stuff will not last. But people will. And it's important as to how we treat them and how we respond as the master taught us. And with that great bottom line, look at that bottom line. Do to others as you would have them do to you. There is also a way to respond that Jim's going to take carry on from here uh, when we deal with community. So, I mean, what we just talked about was strictly on a personal level. Jesus is talking to disciples. Here's how my disciples respond. But when you're in community, you have more responsibility than just for yourself. And so how do you respond uh, in, in, in community as well as uh, personally? So, Jim, take it away. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And uh, it's, I'm going to begin. It's on page 50 in the text. If you have your text tonight and you're looking at it while we're going through, this is going to be 
a review of some of those points that are there, but it's going to have some a little extra added to it. Because one of the principles that we learned in from the people that we visited, they would respond to persecutions in different ways. Some would do one response, some would do another response, depending on their situation. And one uh, pastor very graciously told us, we have to learn how not to judge someone who responds differently to what we would do and accept that if the Holy Spirit is leading that person to respond that way and it's biblical, then we have to accept, especially when whether you choose, whether you flee from the area of persecution or whether you stay. That's the first one is on fleeing when it is clearly the will of God. Yeah, these are what we're calling here are the appropriate responses to persecution and the area of fleeing th there are examples in scripture of where uh, people fled when there was persecution and the very first example is bethlehem when jesus was born uh, king herod was going to kill all the babies two years old and under and mary and joseph fled to egypt they were there for some believe three and a half years, maybe even longer, but for a period of time they were there. And I guess the gold the wise men brought helped pay for all the travel expenses, <laughs> but they were, they were there and they had fled out of the country even into another country because of the persecution that they saw, they were told to flee from. Um, we know that there are many occasions whoops, is that me? Sorry. Uh, where there was fleeing when it was not, when it was the will of God. The early Christians were told to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. They didn't do it immediately when the day of Pentecost came. But long came persecution in Acts chapter 8, and they fled from there. Um, Jesus himself, uh, you say, did he ever flee when it was appropriate? And yes, at one time they wanted to throw him off a cliff up in Nazareth. And it says he walked through the crowd and went on his way. And uh, another time they wanted to stone him, he hid himself and slipped away, it says. So the Apostle Paul did the same thing. There were times when he fled. <laughs> in Damascus, the, 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 the officials in Damascus were looking for him, and the Roman officials outside of Damascus were looking for him. So he actually left town without an exit permit. He didn't get his visa stamped. He went over the wall in a basket, and he fled. So this is an, a, an appropriate response. Any of you with a history, uh, awareness of the history of the Mennonite Church know that the fleeing from one country to another has been practiced by Christians in community during the, the years of church history. So that's one appropriate response. There's another appropriate response, and that is to stay and endure. The uh, history that we have shows that you know, Jesus himself stayed and endured the cross. We talk, we'll talk more about that as well, and Paul's already mentioned that in the first session. But he knew what was ahead of him. He knew he was going to be separated from God, his, uh, the Father, and he was going to be taking upon himself the sin of the world. So he stayed and he endured it. He didn't uh, flee the persecution. Likewise, uh, Stephen was still one of the deacons, and he was in town and he was doing what God called him to do and paid for it with his life. He endured right to the end, even into martyrdom. And the Apostle Paul, at times, Paul endured, stayed where he was as well. And other times he fled. And here we see there's a third response that Paul had, which is appropriate, and that is, he exercised his legal privileges. He said, I'm a Roman citizen, you cannot you cannot do to me what what you're doing because I am a Roman citizen. I appeal to Caesar, and he was sent to Caesar. Now, he still was in prison. He was still persecuted for what he did, but he appealed his, he exercised his legal privileges. And I think that's another venue that some of us have, more so perhaps in Canada and the United States at this moment than they might have in North Korea they don't have in North Korea uh, and other countries where persecution is severe, they cannot exercise legal privileges the way we can. The part that is in, to just wrap it up on this one then, is that the aggressive love is what we term how we respond to persecution. We, they, 
the concept is that we show love. And the story that is in the text of the Ethiopian uh, farmer that I met in uh, southern Ethiopia, he had five hectares of corn that was ripe, ready to be picked. And the night before it was uh, to be picked, uh, thieves came in, destroyed his whole crop, took out all the corn, cut everything to the ground, and told him that as a Christian he was to leave town. And uh, he didn't leave. He stayed in the town. And when I met him, I listened to him being interviewed, and I asked him why, after the interview, why did you choose to stay here as a Christian pastor, leader, teacher in your village? And he said, well, Jim, you need to know something. I used to belong to the religious group that came in here and destroyed my crop. I was their leader at one time in there where they worshiped. And he said, I know their hearts. I know them. They hate Christians. And he said, I had a vision one night before I became a follower of Jesus Christ where Jesus came in the room and he told me that he had chosen me to be a witness for him. I had no idea what that meant, but the next day a pastor came into our village and I asked him, what does Jesus mean by this? And he taught me how to become a follower of Christ. And I became a Bible teacher in my village. I know these people. I am not going to run away. They may even kill me, but I will not run. This was how he chose to respond to persecution. Okay, we go on to uh, quickly through some biblical principles that we learned from the persecuted church. This is significant because, first of all, they're biblical. Secondly, we learn them from those who practice them, uh, which, is, which is why these are so significant. And we mentioned this last week. Um, the, uh, the dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering. So don't be surprised, Peter says, when this happens. So suffering for Jesus is not unusual. Christians all over the world are facing similar and more often worse situations then we are so be encouraged the second principle is to rejoice you know the in luke 6 right after that verse we looked at 22 it gave the four verbs it says rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets and rejoicing is one of the things we are asked to to do when we're in these situations. And the other is to pray with thankfulness. Don't be anxious about anything, Paul wrote, but in everything, prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Uh, one of the great examples is Helen Berhani, um, spent almost three years in those terrible shipping container prisons of Eritrea and horrible, horrible circumstances. And one time she was beaten very badly and thrown back into her shipping container on the floor, a container where you cook in the daytime and you freeze in the nighttime. And she wrote a song. She was a singer. And she wrote a poem that she composed into a song. And it said, thank you, Lord, for the cold nights. Thank you for the hot days. Thank you for the hunger, for the sickness. Thank you for the bugs that bite my body. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Wow, I say. Could I write that? I don't know. But in her circumstances, she was able to articulate her thankfulness to God for even the horrible things she was experiencing. Peter also says we're to evaluate the source of suffering. That makes sure that it's not because we've done something wrong, but that we are truly being insulted because of the name of Christ. Because that is a blessing, as he pointed out, the same as what Jesus told us. We're also told not to be ashamed of suffering. In, and again, in Peter, Peter um, is an incredible book written to first century Christians who are being persecuted. And there's so many principles in that book. It's worth a study just for persecution principles. And he said, however, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. We also respond as Christ did. And as we've seen uh, leading up to this Holy Week, and as we see what Jesus is 
going through um, on Thursday and Friday. He did not return insult for insult. He did not threaten. He did not ask for revenge. He loved them and prayed for them. Also, we refuse to retaliate. From the life and teaching of Jesus, retaliation is never an option. And as his followers, we may do likewise. Now, there was a question in the Q&A a few weeks ago about military people. And Jim and I are going to talk about that probably next week. But there, or maybe even in the Q&A later tonight, the, uh, there is a difference between personal retaliation and your being part of a government body that is is ordained of God to to um, protect people and do good. And so we're going to talk about that at some point. But we're talking here about personal responses. Uh, there was a lady in Indonesia who was the wife of a pastor, Rita, Rita Kongoyo, Koyo, Koli, Rita Kongoli. I can say that if I try hard. And she and her husband was martyred um, by extremists. And she said, I believe God has a beautiful plan behind all of this. Even though at times I feel bitter toward the killer, I always go back to God's word. And then she says, and each time I pray, I ask God to forgive the killer. And that is the key to, to significance um, in uh, uh, responses to the challenges. Uh, Iran is famous for its martyrs. Pastor Hike on the left. Of Heiko Sepi in 1994 in January, uh, he was he was celebrating the release from prison of Mehdi Dibaj on the right. Mehdi was a missionary in in um, Afghanistan. Mehdi came from a Muslim background. He went to Afghanistan as a missionary, and then came back to Iran and he led hundreds and hundreds of people to faith in Jesus, literally. And, you know, you don't do that in a Muslim country and get away with it very long. And so they put him in prison. He spent almost 10 years in prison. And the last few years he spent in a small cell, three feet by three feet with no window. And he said, those are the most beautiful years because Jesus was in there with me. Can you imagine? And um, they, they, they then, after he had been a believer for, I think, 20 years or more, they charged him with apostasy and um, he was going and he was then uh, found guilty and he was th he was he was sentenced to execution well this went out all over the world um, pastor hike on the left was the one who he was the leading pastor of iran at the time and he let everybody know that midi is going to be killed just because 20 years ago or more he he became a believer from a Muslim background. And, uh, and the, the uh, people began to respond from all over the world. And Mehdi Dibaj was ultimately, in December of 1993, he was released from prison and exonerated, and they, did, they said, we never did really uh, plan to execute him. And, you know, even Time Magazine, I never forget that, Time Magazine reported his release, and the title of the little report on it was Answered Prayer. And that was Answered Prayer. And, uh, but just, just days after his release, Pastor Hike was on his way to the airport, and he was martyred, and his body disappeared, and his family was notified many days later. They'd already buried him, saying they didn't know who he was. And so they, they exhumed him and had a, a proper funeral. And they, there is a movie called Cry from Iran uh, that his sons have put together. And that's what's so significant about this story. Hike's sons could be very bitter that their dad was taken from them. They were teenage, late teenagers at, at the time. And they are not bitter. They live in California today and have a ministry to Iran by television and, and, and film. Uh, and videos and whatnot there. Fantastic boys uh, who love their dad and who are not retaliating. They're, they are retaliating by aggressive love for their Iranian people. Uh, Mehdi Dibaj um, was at the funeral for Hike and he, he literally wept. He said, I'm just like uh, Barabbas. He says, Barabbas is the man who, who was released 
uh, when he should have been killed and Jesus was killed and he shouldn't have been killed. And he says, that's the way it is with us. I should have died, not hike. And um, six months later, they found Mehdi Dibaja's body in the park. He had rope burns around his neck and a vigilante group had, had martyred him. Uh, Jim and I were teaching in another country uh, recently, and we met his daughter and granddaughter. The, the daughter, uh, Mehdi, had four children who Pastor Hike and his wife actually took care of while he was in prison. And this daughter uh, was now married, and she has a, a, a what would be Mehdi's granddaughter. And we were teaching some of these SSDS principles, and we got to meet his kids. And it was a very special, special time to actually meet uh, family members of this man who gave everything he was uh, to serve Jesus. Um, the next biblical principle is to trust God. So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good, Peter says. And then stand firm and stand together so that there should be no division in the body. This is where uh, community becomes significant when there's persecution. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it, Paul writes. And one of the great examples in the Old Testament were the three guys, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who stood together against the, uh, the demands of the king that were opposite to their beliefs. And they told the king, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. So they stood firm, but they stood together. There were three of them. Unfortunately, they, you know, now Daniel later had to stand alone, and we often sing a song as kids in Sunday school dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, and dare to make it known. And uh, so many times we may have to stand alone in these situations, but there's so much strength when we can be together in community. We stand together and stand firm. When we follow the will of the Lord, it does not guarantee deliverance. Okay? Just like the three men in the, prison, in the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said God can do it. And even if he doesn't, it isn't going to change our view of him because he is God. In the book of Acts, some people were delivered and some were allowed to suffer. I mean, even James was, was beheaded um, when Peter was released from prison. So we never really understand all that. But that in the will of God, it, we are not guaranteed every time deliverance. So, Jim, I'll turn it over to you. The only way we could think of exp explaining the circle of freedom that we have as Christians is each one of us lives within a certain circle of freedom. And in some circles, there is little hatred, little rejection, little insults from family, government, religious leaders. But in other circles, people have increased expansion of these four things. And that's where we're sort of showing that, that it varies with each individual. It varies in each country. It actually can vary within two parts of the same country. Nigeria can have extreme persecution in the north uh, and Christian freedom in the south. So we, we, uh, we have seen this in, in various countries. Where, and depending on how much each one of those expand, they take over and influence your circle. But the focus is in the center of Jesus Christ. I think this leads us to a, 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 a picture that I want to show you about a, a girl. A girl came to her mother one day and told her mother that she was tired of being a Christian. She was too hard. It was too difficult. She didn't want to. It was she was being oppressed and she was being persecuted. And the mother, if uh, if I can just show you what the mother did here, the mother took a uh, a uh, a large pot of hot water and she went to the to the kitchen and she got a really hard carrot a big hard carrot and she stuck the in the pot of water she put the 
<laughs> Work with me here, folks. My pot is not as big as the carrot. She got a smaller carrot, one of those little mini carrots. <laughs> but she put the carrot in the hot water. And then she went and she got some more water. And she said to uh, them, are you like an egg? And she put the hot, the, the raw egg, she put it into the hot water as well. And she made the water boil in the pot. This is another pot here, you see. And then in the, when all of that was finished, um, she said to them, are you, or are you like a cup of tea? And the daughter was a little confused as to what was she meant by this. But when you, um, the mother then showed her that if you take the carrot, which is hard on the inside, and you put it into the boiling water, the water actually makes the carrot soft. The, the carrot becomes soft and pliable. And so she said, this is uh, what happens sometimes in persecution. People go into the persecution, they're uh, hard in their character, hard in their personality, hard in their way they deal with people. They might even be harsh. And the persecution causes them to become tender or more soft in their relationship to people to be a witness for Jesus Christ. She said, sometimes then people who have gone into the persecution, they went in as a egg, which is soft on the inside, but now it's hard on the, it's hard on the inside. The persecution actually made the water of persecution made it hard on the inside. And this is the part that, that she said, some people respond that way. But the, the part that is the, uh, I gotta get my, I gotta get my teacup going here. And so she said, if you take the hot water and you put the hot water in the cup, and then you bring a, uh, a tea bag, uh, da -da -da -da. here it is here. She said, some Christians are like tea bags. She said, when you put them in hot water of persecution, they actually change the surrounding the surroundings in which they are living and so sometimes people in regions of persecution paul and i have met them in country after country uh, they they are radiant they're full of joy they love their neighbor they pray for their neighbor they do all the things that paul has just uh, taught here at the beginning and they actually start to change the water around them that the the tea bag changes the water in which the perse persecution water becomes changed by the response of the christians to them so those are three little simple illustrations that uh, we have used when we teach overseas to show just how do you respond your response will either make you soft it'll make you hard and bitter or it'll make you actually change the risk uh, the the surrounding community in which you live and fellowship, your family, your community, your church. Okay, Pat. Amen. If I am like the tea, when things are at their worst, I get better and change the situation around me through yeah. Christ likeness. And now we have an assignment for you for uh, two weeks from today. What's happening now is that um, we are going to. Um, be uh, having our next session in two weeks, not one week. Next Tuesday, on the first Tuesday of the month, is the Open Doors Canada Prayer and Information Hour. And so we would encourage you to join that time next week. And then in two weeks from today, we will be back and we are going to deal with a very, very interesting topic, and that's what what is happening in north america and this area and topic and how should we respond uh, and we'll be sending you a, a with uh, christelle will send out to you on her next email blast a um, an attachment that's a pdf of a little booklet that jim and i did uh, some time ago called red skies at dawn um, the coming storms in north america and uh, those storms were already here somewhat then, and not even more so now. Um, and at the same time, because there's two weeks now between tonight and our next session, 
we would like you to to work on an assignment, um, a, a homework study, Bible study project. This is it's, it's easy. It's one of the things that we do in our seminars when we're live and and there in person, and we do together as a group, and it's a really great group activity as well. So we ask you to read the first six chapters of the book of Daniel and make a list of the persecution and response to persecution principles that there are in each chapter. When we're in a seminar, we just break people up into six groups and have them do one chapter. And what we make them do then is after they list all of these principles, and it's amazing how many they find, uh, we ask them then to prioritize them. What's the most important one out of all of these? Which is actually a very hard, hard thing to do. They found it hard to, to say what was the most important and top priority out of that whole list. So that's, that's, uh, what we would ask you to do, uh, uh, next, next time. Uh, we'll, um, I don't know how to get this thing, uh, back. Out, out here, and I lost my. Let me see. I think if I hit escape, there we go. Um, we get out there, and we'll be able to see everybody. Uh, they or at least be seen, see each other. We all we see are each other, which is really sad. We don't get to see you guys, but um, that's that's our time for tonight. I'm going to ask Jim to close in prayer, and then we'll go to Q and A time. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the Church of Jesus Christ worldwide that you are building. You have said you will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, that you, you are victorious. And as we enter this Easter season, Lord, we do thank you for your sacrifice for our salvation and the assurance we have that every one of us uh, listening to the program, listening to the webinar, reading the materials, we're all going to meet together someday in heaven and we're going to be together because of your grace and your salvation so father help us to know how to respond appropriately how to respond biblically and how to respond carefully in love so that we are wise as serpents harmless as doves in jesus name amen amen thank you okay next week we're discussing red skies at dawn this is the the booklet the coming storms um it's a 60 page in this format it was a 60 page booklet and it's written in a story format so it's an interesting read story and we hope that you'll make sure that you get through that before the next session because it will help you a lot with what we want to uh to deal with and to share about what's going on here in the western world and what we see coming and we'll also be reviewing uh, the literature there is i mean you would be amazed at how much literature out there is being written right now about the challenges that we're facing and how do we prepare and how do we prepare for the greater challenges in the days ahead. So that will be, God willing, two weeks from tonight, and we'll look forward to seeing you then. Okay. Blessings. Okay. Thank and you. we we will we will continue looking at some of those questions that were asked before, and we God willing will have a chance to answer them as we go along and get onto those topics like a military versus personal uh, aspects of violence, uh, and and of course the end things that are be happening in the end times, and uh, so that's why we also recommended the book. Um, discipleship on the edge because revelation is a book that deals a lot with what's going to happen in the end time and mm -hmm. daryl johnson has a great perspective on that and on what the focus of the letter is and how we are to respond and we will probably look at that next week as well so yeah. god bless you thank you so much for joining us uh, we enjoy this even though we don't get to see you which is not the, is the part we don't enjoy <laughs> but um uh, this is what happens with COVID, and at least we have a chance to get together. It's, it's super neat. Anyway, so au revoir. God bless you all.